I'm going to talk about the project and I suppose the background to the project and my motivation for getting involved in this project and then how Jeremiah and myself have been working together. Jeremiah is going to so cover the, some of the technology we're using. Um, I'll talk about alternative ways that I've used site visits, some examples. We actually undertook a student survey, so we're going to share some of the findings of that and again, how we're integrating it into my teaching and learning. So we've heard a lot about COVID. Why did I start on virtual site visits? And um, it all started on this day in March uh, 2020. I had always been collecting photographs of buildings and of projects that are happening across the city. And I suppose with this, we all had to pivot our teaching and we all had to think about how we were going to share particularly case studies and project-based learning or problem-based learning. So within our own department and within all engineering departments, site visits are a vital element of that. Um, I suppose they give a sense of purpose and a sense of place to the students. We would have had a very long history of taking, when we were formerly CIT, of taking our students on all of these site visits. And of course, all of this came to a crashing stop. So Engineers Ireland are our accrediting body. And I suppose looking at virtual visits, it's grounded in the literature and in the accreditation of our programs with our professional body, Engineers Ireland. So the literature highlights the importance of student visits to site visits, to manufacturing facilities across our discipline of engineering. And Engineers Ireland in themselves have seven prog uh, program areas that they ask all of the engineering programs that are going to be accredited on how they're going to actually meet these seven program areas. So in looking at, and again, bear in mind, we actually had to go through um, a partial accreditation during COVID, which was online. We had to then demonstrate how we were adapting to meet the seven learning, our seven program areas. So one of them there, uh, discipline specific technology, showing industrial visits and placements and cooperative education ske um, schemes. And then looking at engineering practice, Again, case studies, industrial visits, projects based on real life problems. So how were we going to do all of that if we have a pandemic? And please God, in my lifetime, I hope I never see another one. If for whatever reason, we have a global or a local travel ban, if we have students with inaccessible, with accessibility issues, so you know, universal design for learning and accessibility for all, if there are economic challenges for students to, to visit cities. So this is particularly, I also lecture in architecture, and this is a big issue for students. Most engineer or architectural schools, they do a site visit for a week to a city across Europe. And it is a large financial cost and not every student is able to afford it. So how do we continue to do these things with all of these challenges? So we have a great unit within MTU. Um, it's the tech, teaching and learning unit. And a call came out at the start of COVID um, about and the transitions to CIT, which of course now is transition at MTU. <laughs> um, so I applied and I put away the, um, normally I take students on a bus trip. We go to a real site. How am I going to do that again during COVID? So under Maurice's team, I um, got funding for cameras got myself inducted on what was one of the largest civil engineering projects in the country at the time. And I went out to meet the students. Now, this was a big challenge. This is for any of you that are familiar with the Mill Street Junction and the McCroom Bypass. This was it before it was all cut. And here's me trying to learn how to get my phone to talk to the camera while I introduced or interviewed one of my former students. The great thing about this site is it was full of graduates of our programme. And they were all dying to help me in this initiative. The contractor inducted me and it was a really rich experience for our students. This was another project, uh, Crow's Nest Development, all run. These are graduate engineer and senior project manager at CISC, all former students of ours. And they were running this very large student accommodation project. And at this stage, actually, the restrictions for access to sites had become even more restrictive. So they very kindly shared with me their drone footage, interior shots, how they were going to actually, um, for the canteen areas of the site, how they were dealing with um, space separation. Um, sorry. So I went out, took this photo, went back home and interviewed them all on Zoom. 
So that's how I managed it during the COVID uh, situation. And then came um, a Sattle call for funding. And I put in my name for to see could I progress my virtual site visits to the next level. I was successful in that application. And then I was partnered up with Jeremiah, who taught me a couple of smart technology things. So I'm going to hand over to Jeremiah and he'll, uh, he'll teach. Um, so, yeah, as Mary mentioned, um, we got partnered up through this uh, saddle funding. I'm kind of the technological kind of uh, support for Mary to work on this. Uh, and basically in a previous role, I'd worked on using 360 degree, vi degree video, immersive video for making um, field trips and site visits more accessible. So particularly for students with uh, disability issues, uh, particularly with uh, a marine science course where field trips were a prerequisite. You had to do a field trip uh, in the marine science course to, uh, to pass the course. And the people running the course realized that students uh, with disabilities were self-selecting out of the course. They couldn't do the course because they knew they wouldn't be able to get their wheelchair onto the ship. So as a way around that, they found a river boat where you could take your wheelchair onto the boat. And we started to make these 360 degree videos that would allow other students with disabilities to access them. And so immersive learning is kind of a trend in ed educational technologies. So if you think of VR as being a kind of a trend that a lot of people talk about, but of course, with VR, there's a high, a high entrance barrier. It's quite complex to develop. It's quite costly. But another technology that allows you to use VR headsets and immersive technologies are 360 degree cameras. And these are quite commercially accessible. So here's the example that we have here that we use for Mary's project. Uh, this is the Insta360. They cost about maybe 500 euros or thereabout. Um, and the camera has a lens on both sides. So it's got a 180 degrees of view on either side. It's quite interesting in terms of a teaching tool. So we all know video is quite an effective way of teaching, but typically with video, we're just staring at the camera and we're speaking directly to it. But with this, uh, in terms of immersive learning, you can kind of guide the viewer around the space. So I could be talking to the camera here and then I can bring the student's attention to the people over here and the student has to follow you around the space and it gives them more spatial awareness than a kind of traditional video format would give them. So there are the technologies. So you, you know, in contrast to VR, you don't have to have that technical um, ability or a developer to make the content for you. Low barrier of entry, you can do it yourself, basically. And just very briefly to give you uh, an idea of the workflow. So in the spirit of the conference here, it's about kind of sharing the approaches that we're using. This is the approach I use with Mary's video. It's probably slightly more involved than you would need, but you can do it with just these two steps. So this is the camera, and this is the software that you get with the camera, and that allows you to uh, process it and export it in a way that a player like YouTube really is. When we did this, we added a, a microphone so the audio is a little bit better. We brought it into Premiere Pro, which is a video editing software. And then from there, we exported it out to YouTube. So YouTube recognizes these kind of videos. So when you export the video from the camera, it's in an equirectangular format. So it's in a kind of skewed format. But when you import it to YouTube, it, it fixes the perspective and you can look at it in a kind of 360 degree space. And Going back to VR, you can view it in the same way in a VR headset. So as I said, a very low way, of, a low entry to using VR technology. And just in terms of your own um, disciplines, like field trips and site visits are very common in higher education. So in Mary's instance, it's uh, site visits on construction sites. Uh, depending what you're teaching, it might be geology, geography, whatever it might be, you might have a kind of a field component of your, of your teaching. And these are the reasons that people do field work in higher education. You're supposed to develop observational skills, which you can do with this 360 video, allow students to visit places they would not normally experience. It gives you a version of that, not quite the, the full experience, but if a student had a barrier to entry, they could do that. It allows them to develop their analytical skills. So the, the phone gives you more agency or looking at it through a headset gives you more agency. The student gets to look around the space themselves and decide what they want to look at. So these are just some of the, the reasons that you might kind of employ 360 video for teaching. I'm going to hand back to Mary. So just to kind of um, talk through some of the examples, and maybe if I just go back up to this slide of Jeremiah's, he makes that look really straightforward. <laughs> um, for somebody who hadn't used a 360, there's a lot of learning, but it's a powerful, powerful tool. I think particularly the Insta360 app there in the middle um, where you can import it into. I have that that software now on my laptop, which comes with the with the camera um, and you can do so much inside there. I've been doing these kind of flyovers like the 
the I, the whatever the ski boarders use uh, for different site visits. I've been doing it in social media just to kind of get myself up to speed and sharing it. I have an Instagram account. Uh, so I've been sharing a few things there just to try and get up to speed. But once you get into it, it is very straightforward and um, learning by doing and a lot of YouTubing and with the wonderful input from Jeremiah and the guidance. So in getting the equipment, we wanted to do a prototype. We wanted to try this out. I wanted to make something. So I have a student that is in a wheelchair um, and immediately it brings accessibility issues and how do I address those? So I lecture on a module in health and safety in the built environment. And I suppose an awful lot of my modules, I assess by either project or problem-based learning assignments on real case studies where I've been using my um, my videos that I would have done historically in PowerPoint with just photographs and narrating them. So um, for this project, what we did is we found this is a lovely red shed. Um, it's in a, a new public park in Cork. Um, it's very close to my house, so it was very handy, a very simple structure, so simple to photograph, um, simple to explain for to the second year structural engineering and civil engineering students. And the task we gave them was to take this red shed and reconstruct it on a campus, on a section of our campus in Bishopstown. So we could take the students, all the students, including our students in the wheelchair, to that location on campus. They could see all of the challenges and they had to do the method statement, the risk assessment and all of those other things. So again, we had, we found the engineering drawings. So this is, I suppose, the old way where you share the drawings and you tell the student, this is how this thing is put together. Um, a lot of detail, uh, the structural steel connection details, which are very attractive when they're finished, cross section through the building, or we can go and we can take some photographs. So historically, we've always used the drawings um, and we generally would add in a couple of photographs or we could um, do just a little video with your phone. And again, you share this with the student. And it kind of gives a very good overview to the student that can't get there. And yeah, you know, all the criteria fulfilled for the student to be able to undertake the assignment. So just to give you a bit of context of where the site is. And again, for any of you visiting Cork, we Cork is by the river. Um, the Red Shed is in this location just here, the Marina Park. This is a Google Earth image before it was constructed. And all of this area in Cork is all starting to be developed. So this whole area here, they've started the construction because what I'm doing now, I'm going to continue to collect projects over time. And this is a drone footage from the contractor for this big plot here. But again, you see the context of the red shed. So certainly drone footage gives a great perspective to the student in where the site is. And again, you'll see the red shed over there. Very distinctive. So that's all great. Um, and then... I got the camera, wanted to make something quickly. So um, took some virtual shots, just 360 shots. You hide behind a tree or you hide behind a wall. Everything is operated through your phone. Your phone by Bluetooth talks to the camera. And um, so I created a virtual visit on my, um, on my laptop. For this one, I narrated it. So again, I've turned off the sound here so that's not interrupting the presentation today. And I was able to use the 360 photos to actually give the students an overview of the Marina Park itself, of the context of where the park is the entranceway to 72 acres of, or hectares of parkland. And again, I was able to actually take them on a tour of the Red Shed. So it was very simple. It was screencast using ScreenPal and a pretty straightforward thing to do. Now, if any of you want to click on that link, maybe you'll see my YouTube channel. We've it over very far. Will you be able to read that? Can you read it? Okay. Okay. Does it? Does it work? Oh, yeah. She's going to. Oh, yeah, perfect. Perfect. Now, you don't have to watch it all now, but you get a sense. If you just jumped through it, you'll get a sense of um, of what's in it. It lasts about seven minutes. You don't need to listen to my court voice thrown on. So you can save you can save it for later, but um, but that's using the three hundred and sixty photographs that were imported into my Insta three hundred and sixty, and I was able to use to take the, I suppose the viewer 
around the space while I was talking about the space. So that was good. I was very happy with the output of that. And it certainly helped my students with the assignment that they had and gave them a sense of it. And then if you're ever looking to buy a house, if you're ever looking to buy a house, um, the auctioneers will take you on a virtual visit. And generally the software they use for this is Matterport. So what Matterport is, it's um, you open the Matterport app on your phone. It talks to the Insta360. You take a number of scans of the space and within that space, then it talks back up to the cloud and AI converts it into a virtual walkthrough. Um, so what I've done here is just clipped it very quickly, but you can access my, my MASH report there. Now, because of the repetition of the structure, it wasn't a great structure to use for MASH report, but it really gave the students a very good perspective. And when you're in there or anybody's in there, you can jump around my space in there and have a look and see what they see. So it's like what you see if you're um, a lot of apartments that are for sale or for rent, some hotel rooms are using MASH report. Again, I've just gotten the license for this, reasonable for three spaces, it's about 109 euros for the year. Um, and I have a student, a master's student looking at the conversion of empty units in Cork into social housing. So she can actually borrow one of my spaces, Jeremiah, I'm allowed three users, so we can go now and scan the buildings she's going to investigate. And she can, you can actually measure on Mass Report as well. Reasonably good. You wouldn't want to be kind of counting very closely, but it's a reasonably good level of accuracy. Um, so then we decided we'd go the next level. Um, and so we went down and I narrated through three different steps down at Porky Cueve. So Porky Cueve is the centre of G the GA in, in all of Ireland. Isn't that right, Emer? <laughs> um, centre of GA in Cork. And um, the uh, so it's all part of the Marina Park, OK? Um, and within that, um, I talk through, there's a lot of sustainable urban drainage. So there's a lot of civil engineering here. This whole area is, is prone to flooding. And within that, then, if you click on that link, this is where the magic happens. Is it working? Yeah, so, so just about this with me. Um, yeah. So when we made this, it was kind of with a view of putting the uh, 360 video in the VR headset. And we'll talk a bit more about, you know, how well that worked and or maybe didn't. But we're using it on YouTube, which can play back in the VR headset. But more importantly, it plays back on your phone, which is quite useful. So for those of you who have clicked on that link, you might be able to look around. If you haven't, you can see here, as I move my phone, it uses the accelerometers in your phone. So I can look around the space. It's kind of like a, a portal into the space. And I can see Mary over there and I can kind of look around the space myself and get my own sense of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so that's kind of the example. So maybe if you wanted to take a quick look at that, uh, and then we might take a break from talking at you and give yeah. you uh, An exercise a small, short. small, very short exercise. In your way. And if you want, to, you can use that as an example to have a look around. If you look around the space. Um, the yeah. 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 Like, it's not that accurate, but it's really, it, you know, you see yeah. the relative size. That's kind of what we should... Yeah, if you want to have a look at that one there, you can, it's my phone. You can have a look around. So rather than a video, you know, where you just give the students, you know, you tell them what to look at, they can look at things themselves, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so if you play it, it's a video, but you are allowed to look around the entire space. So, so if you... Yeah. Yeah, so there's Mary over there, but if I want to see there's a thing. So, um, and you know, if any of you have ever taught, uh, taught students in a, a, a site specific space, a lab, you'll know that they don't look at you the whole time. They're always looking at the things around them and they're kind of getting a sense of the space and the different tools and resources. So this is kind of one of the affordances of this kind of video. So maybe if we go on to the next slide. Yeah. So now that you've kind of had a look at this, maybe just to give you a quick break and maybe just have a chat with the person next to you or the people on your table. Um, can you think of a way that you might be able to use this in your teaching? Could this be beneficial to you in some way? Are you teaching a spatial topic? Like, are there spaces uh, in your discipline that you talk about a lab, you know, uh, a gym, whatever it might be? 
And are, are there any parts of your topic that might be helpful for a kind of immersive learning experience for your students? And also accessibility. So do you have students that may have accessibility issues that can't go to certain spaces? That might be another way. So maybe if you just take two minutes just to chat to people around you, that would be helpful. Okay, that's true, yeah. Yeah, we're okay, are we? Yeah, yeah. Because I want to show some faces. Yeah. So literally give us like one minute. Yeah. Okay. Okay, will we will we continue on and I share a few more a few more case studies? Okay, great that there's this conversation about the few minutes and questions at the end, and then we can kind of see if I can start with the Okay, so how how can we in how can we integrate this into teaching? Okay, um, so like for me, I've been using it um, as I said during COVID. You know, with my camera, I the, for instance, I lecture in the School of Architecture. I had architectural students that never had been in the school because they were online. Uh, I had a lot of photographs of the construction of the building. I had all the camera gear. I was given permission to go in and photograph inside the building and I knitted it all together to, to share it with the students. So they got a structural assignment. I had students do a health and safety because of course I made up a fictitious we were taking down a wall or we were moving the roof or whatever. Um, I used it for project management assignments because that particular case study is very challenging. And in explaining construction technology. And this to me, like, I just got a, a light bulb moment. Um, I took students on a visit and again, explaining timber frame housing, very difficult to do on a 2D drawing or a 2D power slide or PowerPoint slide. I can build up this collection of different construction technologies now and different methodologies. I'm sharing them with my colleagues across um, a team site within the department. And I'm now able to record, and I suppose I have a lot of contacts across the industry, record different construction projects that are ongoing in the university and in the city. So this is a new housing scheme down in Middleton. Timber frame construction brought my first years on a site visit there. And you can just see what... You can see, you could never show that in a classroom before. And it's so quick. I just take one photograph, stand behind the wall, take it, and then I am narrating or I can just record it onto a video and then I can share it with the class and explain it. And then I got a very tall student and um, so gave him the stick. He shoved it up into the first floor and now we could see what was on the first floor because of course there was no stairs in this house. So, you know, you're passing a building site and you want to have a look at what's over the wall. You can actually take this thing, this stick and poke it up and get a good perspective of it. And I've shared this with a number of my colleagues in architecture and in civil engineering, such a simple way to explain how something is made. And obviously I can pause it and I can label it. Again, this is all work in progress. So we have a lovely new building um, happening out in MTU. It's called the Learning Resource Centre. So um, as part of my health and safety and the built environment module this past semester, I um, took all the students out to visit the site. So this is my student that um, used to be with us before his accident and is back finishing his degree with us. I can't take him up to the roof of this building. So how am I going to do it? It's not fair that he can't see what the others can see. So I went in and this is kind of, again, taking the picture and bringing it into Insta360 on my, on, my soft, on my computer. And for the MTU colleagues, this is what the roof looks like. And you can zoom in on this if I want to. I can be narrating the detail of the RC frame in the building. Um, and then 
I took a lot of photographs again internally within the building. I could be using it. And in years to come, I'll use these photographs. For instance, I want to demolish that wall or I want to demolish that column. All kind of different project-based um, assignments. So in trying to understand, because I, I, I'm, I just think it's fab, right? But I wanted to understand the students think it was fab. Um, so what we did, and again, to gather data, and I suppose to educate Jeremiah and myself on what they think works and what doesn't work, um, we undertook a survey of the cohort that um, had taken this project with me. And Jeremiah is just going to give us a whistle stop through to some of the outputs. Yeah, so I guess like anything, when you, when you do it, you have an idea of why it's good or why it works. But uh, it was interesting running this in a class full of students. There were about 45 or 50 students, I think, in the room. And we showed them the various things that you've just seen with Mary, the 2D video, the Matterport scan, and the 360 immersive video. We also brought a, a VR headset for them to try out, which we have here. So you can try it out afterwards if you want to see what it looks like in the headset. And we surveyed them. And some very interesting findings. Like one, one for example, was finding out their fami familiarity with 360 degree video before and after taking the session. Um, and a few were familiar with it beforehand, beforehand, but afterwards all were familiar. Um, none of them indicated that they were unfamiliar. And just in terms of a, an educational sense, this is very valuable. You know, there are various uh, EU initiatives about digital competencies and making sure students are, you know, able for the, the world of work with new technologies and being up to date. So this is the Digital Competence Framework EU initiative. And so here we talk about uh, facilitating learners' digital competence. So, you know, even just by showing them this technology in the class, making them familiar with it, you know, we're enhancing their uh, digital skills and knowledge um, for when they go out into the workforce. Trying to get a sense of whether they thought 360 degree video provided a more comprehensive view of the site and, and the building compared to 2D photographs. Uh, they strongly agreed, so about 40 out of the 46 that took the survey said it was much better, basically. And I think this is really kind of an important element of it. It's the idea of spatial relationships. So we asked them, did they think 360-degree video enhanced their understanding of the spatial relationships within the site? And of course, that's very important for students working in construction. They want to know the area, they want to know what it looks like and how things are located. And 40 out of 46 said it improved their spatial understanding, which again is a, an important finding. We asked them to rank the form of immersive video, which gave them the greatest understanding. They said the VR headset was the best. The video on the phone, the 360 video that you just looked at was second best and the screencast of lessons ranked behind that. Um, but actually what we found in the class of uh, 45 students was that with the headset, the teacher needs a facilitator or a teaching assistant to put the headset on, make sure it's clicking. You know, the student puts it on, they can't find the video, you got to help them again. Whereas with the phone, as soon as they scanned it, they all opened it up, they were all looking around it, and it kind of democratized the experience for them. They all, they're all using a technology that they were familiar with, their phone that they're all using. They didn't feel uncomfortable about it. I, I asked about 12 students to try the headset. 10 of them tried it. One or two of them were hesitant to try it. Maybe they didn't want to be the one with the headset and kind of putting themselves out there. Um, so that was kind of an interesting finding. So um, from a pedagogical sense, the VR headset is probably the best immersive experience, but the one that resonated with the students most was the ability to be able to look around the space with their phone, which, which we thought was quite interesting. Um, and that's kind of what I was talking about there, the limitations or affordances of the technologies. The VR headset is the best way to experience it, but actually the phone is the one that the students liked most in the sense that it gave them a quick way of looking into a space, uh, which we thought was quite interesting as well. And if you want to add anything here, if I'm missing yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's it. Um, in running the lesson, we learned a couple of other things as well. Um, I had the video on YouTube with my voice speaking. And of course, we had 50 in the room and all of a sudden all 50 voices were all. So I think there's a lot of learning to be had, even just in undertaking that survey last week. Um, I would have put it up on I would have put it up on YouTube with no sound and got them to open that link instead. Will we go on to the next yeah. slide? And actually on that, so we kind of learned. So the video that we made was Mary narrating 360 space. If you were using it for learning and teaching in the classroom, you might do a version without audio. So the students would mm. open it up, there would be no audio, they could look around the space, and then the teacher in the classroom setting could kind of explain what they wanted them to kind of what, what they wanted to draw their attention to. Do you want to speak on that one? Yeah. So how effective the 360 degree immersive videos were uh, for understanding the site and the building. Again, largely they, you know, they thought it was a highly effective way of um of learning about the space. Uh, again, kind of backed up what we what we had thought. 
And this is kind of what we were just uh, alluding to there a while ago in terms of the learning spaces. Uh, maybe do you want to talk to the first one? Or two? Yeah, um, I suppose, you know, students pick up a lot in the classroom and then they like to go home and they like to pick up some more. So I think if I was doing this again, I would post it one in silence for the classroom and with the audio for them when they'd go home. So I think that's a very important, you know, um, take away from it. And I think the hesitancy of a number of them to not wear the headset, do they feel it was geekish? Do they feel they didn't want to know? And again, there's also, it makes some people feel nauseous. So there's a lot of different issues, whereas the phone, you know, it's, and it's so easy to post on YouTube as well. So. Um, and then again, kind of touched on this, but as we're, as we've been doing this, we're trying to write a paper out of it. And kind of a way of thinking of it as a, a teaching methodology is the idea of a virtual portal. You know, we have portals in, you know, media and film and stories, you know, throughout history. You know, here's an example, Stargate TV show with a portal that people go through. And, uh, and the phone becomes that kind of virtual portal for them, kind of allowing them a kind of spatial transition into a different space, which I think is a really interesting idea. Um, and then this affords the kind of a BYOD approach, like bring your own device. It's that familiarity and comfort with the technology that they're using on a day-to-day -day basis is, is kind of better for them, I think. Or they are actually more comfortable using it anyway. So I suppose just looking at a word cloud of some of their responses, um, you know, a better understanding, better insight. They really got the site. They really got the context, um, which is very hard to do from a flat set of 2D drawings and possibly a photograph. Um, so I'd say maybe we move on to the next one because I yeah. focus on some of the particular comments. We asked the students for some comments. You know, they felt that it was vision learning that they were um, seeing that they, they really feel this is the way forward for engineering or for educating our students. Uh, you get a better comprehension of the scale of the structures. And particularly in the headset, you're in the space. I was in Rotterdam recently and I took some footage in Rotterdam port and we were beside some boats and you kind of, this big boat is over your head, you know, it's just incredible. I haven't had time to knit some of that stuff together. And you can see everything you want around you and not just in one spot. And I think that was really good because particularly where the red shed is, I suppose I chose it for a number of different reasons. The red shed structure in itself, but obviously it's part of Marina Park. It's part, part of the future of Cork development down there. But also you've got sustainable urban drainage. It's tending to flood. You've got Porky Cueve, which is an iconic structure. And I do another lecture on that as well. So that one video on YouTube is sharing all those three spaces or all those three stories. Um, Certain complex issues like the timber frame construction, very hard to explain that when you're just looking at 2D drawings again. Whereas if you actually use that little clip that I got down in Middleton, it really explains to the student how it was pieced together, if I was to, to use that term. And again, it's the closest you can get to being there through media. So it's very effective and particularly for Access for All and for UDL. Maybe just on this uh, yeah. uh, link to a big project that's happening in our sector in, the, in terms of the technological universities is the NTutor program. Uh, and so that's really a program about transforming learning, teaching and assessment by focusing on transforming the student experience and developing the capabilities of all staff to address sustainable pedagogical and learning environment with a particular and critical focus on digital transformation. That's a mouthful. <laughs> and it draws in the SDGs as well. So, And that's kind of something that was in mind when we were working on this as yeah. well. I suppose I lecture on sustainability um, and the intuitor, um, these are the, the six pillars. So like when having reflected on what I've done with these 360 videos, I'm certainly ticking the sustainability box because we're reducing the carbon footprint even of just, you know, um, paper and drawings and whatever. Absolutely universal design for learning, EDI and inclusivity for all students and uh, not on the academic integrity part. Uh, digital transformation, absolutely. And again, employability, are, we're sharing with our students and they're even able to go, for instance, um, if they're doing an interview or whatever, to talk about actual case studies they've done. Um, so I suppose the plan is to keep and build upon um, the best of the pandemic. You know, when we pivoted because of COVID, the worst thing we could do, I think, is pivot right the way back to where we were dump the stuff we don't like or didn't work and keep absolutely and build on the stuff that was good and the stuff that worked. And for me, the stuff that worked was these virtual visits because I have them in my database, I have them in my bank and I can draw them and twist on them for different assignments for different students. Um, universal design for learning, you know, we have to go there. And certainly this is providing that and meeting that. EDI, 
Access for All, and it's a fabulous basis for great project-based learning and problem-based learning assignments. So thank you very much. I think yeah. that's the... Uh, yeah, and... Hopefully, maybe to refer back to that little peer and chair exercise that you had. Maybe if you have some questions now, we could take some questions or be really curious to hear if you had any ideas based on your own teaching and disciplinary background. Yeah. Sorry about this, uh, but I will play the devil's advocate. Absolutely. Uh, I love it. Yeah. So isn't a key skill set among these students the ability to go from 2D, 2D drawings and, and maths mm. across to 3D? Absolutely. And, and this might I, I, I'm, I'm guessing these students spend a lot of time working on, on, on that transformation. I'm like, do we really draw it? So, we're mm. so um, the point, point might be that this kind of is training in that skill set. So, I'm going to counteract what you've just said, and I'm going to say I totally agree with you. Um, so one of my modules, you have to draw, learn to draw in 2D to be able to put the 3D space together. Absolutely. And I used to do first year drawing. Because, and as a person that never did drawing in secondary school, when I went into university, I couldn't visualize the 3D space and the projections of the 2D. So absolutely, we always start in our department with 2D. But if I am, um, bear in mind the red shed, the task was a health and safety assignment. So um, within our department, we're looking at all the competencies of the engineer. Um, so we do do the 2D drawing, but going into the 3D space, we do the BIM, we do the building information modeling, uh, we do the Navis works and the, and the walkthroughs and all of that. But at the end of the day, I am doing project based assignments of a case study. So like, for instance, the School of Architecture, it's got a magnificent atrium in the middle of it and the architects would probably kill me. But one of the assignments I got them to do during COVID was to infill the atrium with a floor. And I gave them the structural drawings and I did the virtual visit so they knew how it was put together because that's what we have to do as, as designers. We have to know how to build and possibly deconstruct elements of it to do adaptations. Um, so they don't need to be able to draw it for my assignment in project management or in health and safety. So I would absolutely agree with you. Um, there's that as well. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't think that's a replacement for like core skills. If you're uh, an engineer, you have to be able to draw things for sure. But it's more about a menu of different teaching methodologies. So it's just one more thing that you can add. Um, and also thinking about kind of graduate outcomes. So when a student finishes their, their degree, they go out into the workplace, they have different stakeholders. So if they want to speak with the building construction manager, then they need the drawings because that's the genre that, of information that that person works with. If they want to talk to the community, maybe the 360 video is a better way to kind of show them something and demonstrate something. So it's just giving them another tool to kind of communicate their ideas, I think. Yeah. And, and absolutely, I lecture in project management and stakeholder management. And if you have the residents of a neighborhood, a 2D drawing means nothing to them. Whereas if they can actually look and see what the red shed would look like in the Marina Park, hey, presto, at least they get that part. And now you can have the conversation about whether they like the development or they don't like it. So it's, as I say, it's it's using all of the skills. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions? Or I'm just curious, did anyone in your little conversation have an idea of how this might be used in their own uh, teaching? Any examples? Nothing sprang to mind. Yeah, we were like, Sean was discussing um the able on practical exercise four degrees um yeah. present teaching and often we can find another student maybe in a large space and like see them all the time mm -hmm. or you're assessing the only pressure in time like, mm -hmm. um but so might offer a good two for follow up on an assessment or yeah, I'm giving the students that immersive maybe experience. Yeah, and 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 yeah, I'd be happy. I, I could maybe go to one of Thomas's classes and record something there if you're happy for me, and we can I can export it and see what you like or what you don't like. Um, but like it's it's so simple. Like it's probably the smallest camera you're ever going to have. Actually, just thinking about that in terms of that's it. That's like that's it. It's it'll fit in your back pocket. It fits in my handbag and the stick folds down and it's it's just a magic piece of kit and it talks to my phone. Now, obviously, everything is talking to my phone, which I'm now finding is my next challenge because the Matterport port is talking to my phone. This is talking to my phone. Uh, YouTube is talking to my phone. So my poor phone will have to be upgraded next. But uh, do you want to get the headset and see if yeah, people... Yeah, we can try that. But just in terms of your discipline, I can imagine if you were teaching the students about personal training in the classroom and you were showing them the gym, 
Uh, and you could use myself as an example, a 40 something year old, relatively unfit person. And you could say, what order would you bring these students on a, on a tour of the gym? You know, maybe some cardio first. And you could kind of show them the different spaces and give them a pathway around the gym. Uh, that might be an interesting way of using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's students in the student that might have particular challenges and would feel much more comfortable. The mass report, like I have one on my laptop there, I'll show you of the one I just like it takes. I did my office in the corridor outside of it going into the room next door. Um, you just put this out, you stand behind the wall, press print, you know, and on to the next one. Give it about an hour, stitches it together, you get a link to say that it's ready, and uh, you access it in the in the my on my laptop, or I can do it on my phone in my spaces as well. It's it's fantastic. So it's like it's I suppose the Matt report obviously is is taking your data and it's in the cloud and it's being processed elsewhere. But but just from the point of view of being able to show it to students, absolutely. Um, my question is how camera could be effective on long distance if it's inscrutable for planning or landscape planning, take photos of yeah, 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 totally. I mean, as so, in one of the examples Mary showed there, uh, she was on the roof and she was able one, yeah. to, to zoom in in quite, yeah. quite mm -hmm. good detail. Yeah, so, like, the, yeah, yeah. the videos that come out of it are quite large, they're like they're eight, 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 eight. Well, that was only a, that was only a photo. I just yeah. took, I took a photo up on the roof and then I opened the photo on the Insta360 software yeah. and we had screen cast or screen pal recording while I moved around the space and while I zoomed in and like you'll see there was an awful lot of detail in that video you could see you could nearly see the diameter of the pipes and the fixing the fixing details and um, I think if you go to the latter half of that video yeah that one yeah yeah they're, they're, it's just a very high resolution camera uh, now I should say this is the that, that those photos were taken with uh, the X3 camera which is the newer version, This it, it had a little accident and it's gone away to the hospital. So this is the X1 version. But, and again, it's probably this, like if you look here, you can see the detail of the, um, the fixings for the pipework on the roof. Um, if you open this in the classroom in the app, you would be able to zoom in quite far. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, eventually you'll lose some uh, resolution, but you can get quite far, I think, with this, yeah. Like even just that shot in itself gives you a really good insight of what the inside of that building is like. Um, if you were a landscape architect and you want to take a couple of shots, or even the one I have up on YouTube at the moment, the narrated seven minutes, you will see there, if you go onto that, you'll see that was just a photo. And I opened that photo in 360 and spoke around it. So yeah, but again, I could stitch them all together as a video, like what we've done in the latter part. For, for, well, you see, I suppose just for recording me talking and sharing it with students. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, no, that's oh, okay. I mean, one, one issue with that, I think, would be that it probably wouldn't be appropriate to record all the students in this half. Of the room. Yeah. So, can, can you, you, can, can, you can, you can, yeah. 150. 150. It's a 150, okay. Yeah, it can. You can turn, you can turn the back off. Engineering precision. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, it doesn't even yeah. record it because often it becomes very boring. And you That's true, yeah. I haven't, yeah. I haven't, I haven't thought of that one. It's probably enough for them to watch me three, three different locations in Parky Cueve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good point because sometimes you know uh, recorded videos of a teacher they are on the teacher when they should be on the on the yeah. vice versa at different times. And, and again, you see, I suppose the one thing I've learned about this is, and like you know, I am not a technologist, he, so I've I've encountered a lot of challenges, and what might be intuitive to Jeremiah hasn't been intuitive to me. So I've had to do a lot of fiddling around, if I was to call it. Like I've spent hours 
um, and, you know, how to get the photographs out. And, you know, I'm not too sure how long an hour's lecture would take on the SD card. Would it actually go on one card? I'm not too sure. Uh, yeah, depending on the size that you use. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's a lot of it's learning about the different technologies and what they can do. So I, I would say, though, from, a, from the educational technologist perspective, I think with the, only a little, like, so if you're not techie yourself, I think if you go to wherever your ed tech department is, they can help you quite easily. You know, it's not a high bar uh, as, as opposed to developing some computer generated VR content. Yeah, like, let's put it this way um, Primary Year Pro and the Adobe software, um, like ScreenPal, I used during COVID um, recording the PowerPoints. And again, they're all very straightforward. The Insta360 and the Portal. Very straightforward. The Premiere Pro is my next challenge. And I do want to, because it was Jeremiah knitted those three videos together. I want to learn how to knit those. That's my next technological advance. <laughs> but, um, we we have a short survey, if you'd be willing to take it. So if you scan that code, you can uh, take the survey. Uh, it does ask you about using the headset. I think and, we deleted that question. Oh, we didn't leave yeah, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we do have the headset with us. So if anyone wants to try it or just get a sense of it in that, in that piece of technology, um, just let us know. We'll be around today and tomorrow. We'll keep the headset with us. Yeah. yeah. I think that's us. So thanks again, everybody, for your attention and uh, for everyone's presentation. It's been really interesting. Right? Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. And can I just say thank you to all of the organizers of this and to the two Tinas and all our emails over and back and to Creed University.